patriotism, faith, national unity, education, fiscal responsibility, civility, the values that define America. Fascinating stories and talks from America-loving patriots dedicate to preserving freedom, opportunity, and justice. Welcome to the Friends and Fellow Citizens Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Friends and Fellow Citizens. I'm your host, Sherman Talosky. Once again, thank you so much for listening into this episode. I hope you enjoy it. Today, we will be talking about one of the most well-known figures and founding fathers in American history, Samuel Adams. Before we get to this exciting guy, I want to first make a quick announcement. Next month, I will be making an announcement about the Patreon memberships. Um, I've been thinking a lot about adding more benefits to our Patreon members and switching things up a little bit, Uh, but I'm going to make that very clear to all of you next month, and uh, I will let you all know when that will happen, and uh, I, I guess this was an announcement about an announcement, but anyway, just make sure you stay tuned for that. And uh, let's get right into today's episode. All right, now you might be thinking, when you think of Samuel Adams, when you hear Samuel Adams, you might be thinking of the beer that you get at the supermarket. Well, I can tell you that if you do enjoy beer and you like Samuel Adams, it would be very fitting to uh, get a, a bottle right now of Samuel Adams, kick back and relax and listen to this episode about this founding father. All right, we're going to start off with his early life. He was born in Quincy, Massachusetts on September 22nd, 1722. And Adams was uh, born to a pastor, um, and his father was very influential in politics at the time. They were especially very involved in popular politics. Adams really got that influence early on, but that wasn't really what he wanted to do initially. He actually wanted to you know, study law. Uh, he didn't really go down that road. Uh, the, he, then he also knew, obviously knew that there was the area of business. His father was a merchant, and he thought, well, I might have gotten the genes from his father. Well, uh, I guess I guess maybe the genes skipped a generation because Adams was – not so good with money. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about his financial situation later on in his life, a little bit later in the episode. But basically, he... I I don't I don't know. Um, he, he would not be a great treasurer, let's just say. Um, he, he got some money from his dad, but somehow he just kind of just spent it, I guess, and he didn't really have anything to show for it. So business, not not his style. Well, then he realized that Something was going on in the colonies that he absolutely was not okay with. There were acts like the Sugar Act and the Stamp Act, which were absolutely hated by everybody in the colonies. People thought it was outrageous that they had to pay for additional tax that, frankly, didn't really mean that much. It was just kind of another way to get money. And uh, to say that Adams was... Angry about this is really an understatement. Um, I'm I'm surprised at how at times he was able to even keep his con- composure from what I've read, and he really took advantage of writing, and he just went ballistic on the stamp act, on the sugar act, on on the British. He he read a lot about you know the fall of the Roman Empire and knew that if this um, environment of political discourse and of this this t- tyrannical nature keeps going. You're not going to have a country anymore, not much less an empire. And he really started getting involved, even at lower levels of government. Um, he was always trying to figure, find an, uh, opportunities to get his opinion out and to really speak to the average person. 
Um, and he, yes, he was, like I mentioned, in government, but the, I think this is really where he gets his talent, which is the writing and the oratorical uh, sp- skills. He was a really good speaker. In 1768, he helps circulate something called the Massachusetts Circular Letter. And this is essentially a protest against what was newly introduced as the Townsend Acts. So after the Sugar Act and the Stamp Act were hated, uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, essentially the treasurer of uh, the British government, Charles Townsend, uh, erroneously thought that his ideas of taxes would be a great idea. Uh, Well, apparently not, because this letter, I think, is really the precursor to what we know as the American Revolution. This idea that a government that doesn't listen to the people, that can't even respect any kind of representation, is going to be a major, major problem. And not just a problem that affects the the sanity, honestly, of the people, but it would lead to an entire collapse of society. And this was the idea that this letter was espousing. I'll read some excerpts from this letter to you. I won't read the whole thing. It's a little bit long. But I'll read a couple of excerpts here. Here it says, right around the middle, quote, It is, moreover, their humble opinion, their being the representatives who came together and wrote this letter, obviously Adam is being an influential member, it is, moreover, their humble opinion, which they expressed with the greatest deference to the wisdom of the parliament, that the acts made there imposing duties on the people of this province with the sole and express purpose of raising revenue are infringements of their natural and constitutional rights because they are not represented in the British parliament, his majesty's commons in Britain. All right, I'm going to stop there. What's unique about this language is that it sounds very similar to the grievances that are outlined in the Declaration of Independence. And if you're thinking that, you have the right idea, because this really is one of those written documents that doesn't get a lot of attention nowadays, but I, I, it's so important to recognize how big of a deal this was. Complaining to the king, especially if you're the colonies, I mean, you're, you're like a, you're an ocean away, you know, you, the Britain just fought a seven years war, so they're probably thinking, well, we protect you guys, so you guys have no say. Imagine how, how a loyalist or someone working from the crown would feel reading this. They took it as a huge insult and a crime. That was how big of a deal this was. No one in that day and age would really dare to express grievances, unless you were able to overthrow the king, obviously. I'll read the last part here, which says, quote, and these are the sentiments and proceedings of this house. They have too much reason to believe that enemies of the colonies have represented them to his majesty's ministers and to the parliament as factious, disloyal, and having a disposition to make themselves independent of the mother country. This house cannot conclude without expressing their firm confidence in the king, our common head and father, that the united and dutiful supplications of his distressed American subjects will meet with his royal and favorable acceptance, unquote. The, the key thing that I took out of this quote, and maybe it's something that you've taken it out, which is independent of the mother country. Again, really unprecedented. This kind of language and put out there right in the heart of Massachusetts was unbelievably risky. And Adams was a huge, huge part of this. He was the guy whom you spoke to him and he he would just speak his mind, you know, and not just speak his mind, but it defend his integrity and his values, saying why he believed this way. He, w- he would probably quote something from the ancient Romans or from the ancient Greeks or from John Locke, this idea that there are rights being trampled on and no one in parliament cares. That was a huge, huge message that he wanted to bring out. Well, this actually turned out to be very consequential because later that year, 
the British send troops to Boston. Okay, now this is really, really getting messed up. I said that Adams was very furious. Now he was really, really, really mad. I mean, just imagine like that anger meter like ticking up, ticking up more and more. Um, it's, it's in some kind of overdrive now. And this is, but this is where it gets a little interesting because I, I want to kind of revert to a couple things here before I move on here about the story of the, the British occupation. Uh, number one is, you know, Adams covers so much of the American Revolution. And for the sake of this episode, I will focus on the the, the f- several things that led to, you know, his idea of, you know, assigning the, the Declaration of Independence, which is kind of unknown. You know, the proceedings of what he did in the Second Continental Congress is quite unknown because of the secrecy. And understandably, the delegates didn't really want to uh, be super duper vocal about what what exactly they did. Um, so just the, just that quick note. The other thing, though, is Adams historically, like when I say historically, I mean like 19th century all the way to nowadays, he can often be portrayed as kind of a crazy guy. And that's kind of what I thought. I'm not going to lie. I, I did think that he was a bit of a hothead. And, and maybe he was, and understandably so. Um, but this is a classic example of why that might not be so true. You see, when the British sent troops over there, Adams had already been being has had already been kind of harassed by the British. Like I was mentioned earlier, he was very very vocal about it. Um, he did have pseudonyms, uh, but I guess they didn't really work super duper well with certain people, and it caught the attention of the uh, the governor of Massachusetts, uh, which. In the 1760s was a guy named Francis Bernard. Governor Bernard was the guy who was in charge of doing something about this resentment that was happening in Massachusetts. And that he was supervising uh, this occupation. And Adams worked really hard through writing, through talking to people, both you know, um, convening with the, uh, the Boston town halls, with... Um, Helping uh, you know, speak with representatives of uh, with the crown and uh, with um, other you know local constituencies, if you want to call it that, in Massachusetts and all around the the, the neighboring area, uh, he tried his very best to work out something um, so that the the troops could leave Boston. He didn't want the troops there. Obviously, a lot of a lot of people in the area hated the the fact that the troops were there. But uh, Governor Bernard was not really letting go here. And Adams, like he, like he did before, he started writing more. He wrote a lot of commentary, uh, really uh, some things not so true, by the way. Uh, but he used this power of using a narrative to describe what, this, what was happening. It was kind of like a story. It's kind of like you know, he understood the the sentiments of how people felt. And I think he just took that and he created a narrative saying, you can do something about it. You can call on these troops to leave. What these people are doing to you and your livelihoods is not right. And it actually hadn't always been the case in terms of his effectiveness. In fact, uh, a little bit later on, um, the the British did start making some changes on how they dealt with taxes or um, leaving taxes because of the pressure, economic pressure that was happening, the lobbying, and some people didn't like Adams. Didn't they? Didn't like his messages very well. They thought that you know this effort to overthrow the British crown well, maybe wasn't such a great idea. But in, in this instance. Adams was very, very persistent on this mission to get troops out of Boston. And he was so persuasive with his efforts, with the efforts of countless people. He was able to kick out, essentially, Governor Bernard. Bernard left for England in 1769, and and he never came back. I think one of the reasons why is because he he didn't want to deal with Samuel Adams again, (laughs) which is a good enough reason, I guess, if you're a loyalist. And you might be wondering, well, what did the British try to do to Samuel Adams? Well, just like the tyrants they are, 
they tried to bribe Samuel Adams. Yes, there there were people who were who thought that there here is some poor guy probably just complaining about about freedom and tyranny, maybe because he didn't have a lot of money. Now remember last time I said that he didn't do very well business. Well, throughout his life, he not only lived a very frugal life, but he he really had to because he didn't have a lot of money. He was getting so involved in this, and there were so many other trades that he could have been involved in, but he chose not to do so. And so when even when he was offered a, a an office or a bonus or some kind of cash payment, he refused. He kept saying, no, I, I don't want this. This is not the part of who, what I believe in and who I am. And I'll, I'll give you an example here. There's one time, this was after Bernard left, there's another guy came in named Thomas Hutchinson, who you might recall from our John Hancock episode. Uh, Hutchinson had a deal with Hancock, and of course he had to deal with Samuel Adams, so he didn't have the easiest job, let's just say, for, for a loyalist. But one time Hutchinson was asked by a member of parliament uh, about Adams, and, and this guy was asking, you know, it's like, jeez, we, we keep offering this guy bribes and offices. And he doesn't seem to want any of this. What, what, what is going on? And Hutchinson reportedly said this quote. He said, quote, Such is the obstin- obstinacy and inflexible disposition of the man that he never can be conciliated by any office or gift whatever. Unquote. Now, if there's any... And look, I'm not a Thomas Hutchinson fan... But if there was anything that we can get out of Governor Hutchinson that could be of some kind of value, I think it's this quote. Adams was offered so many chances to be wealthier, to be better off than he had ever been before, at least in his early life. But he never budged. Really, really remarkable. You would think, you know, if you took 100 people and you told them, and every single one, let's say in this situation, and you would say, look, you can you can be wealthy for the wet rest of your life if you just stop with this this complaint or this protest or whatever you're doing. I'll bet you 99, almost 99 people, maybe 99 people out of 100 might take it, especially depending on the well, depending on the circumstances for sure. But think about how much power and how much wealth you can gain. Samuel Adams might be that lone guy to say, no, I don't want this. What happened after the occupation uh, turned very, very ugly. The Boston Massacre occurred March 1770. I won't go too much into detail in this episode. Maybe in another episode we will. Uh, But this was really because the troops obviously never fully left, even with a lot of convincing. Troops still didn't leave, and we, we, we had five colonists dead. Adams knew that he needed to take advantage of this. He needed to show the British that this was just the beginning of a long train of grievances to, I'm going to quote from, from the Declaration of Independence, that this was just the beginning of a, of a large... You know, and almost seemingly endless tyrannical run for the crown. And something obviously came out of this with the Boston Tea Party in 1773. Again, this is the whole episode in itself, but I'll briefly mention that there, there was, there is a lot of speculation as to what his role was with the Boston Tea Party. It's unknown, but. As an orator, he probably he did convene a meeting in Faneuil Hall, which obviously was really his, uh, I guess his kind of home turf, so to speak. And he is someone who knows how to get a crowd excited, but it's still very unclear as to what he actually did to contribute to the Boston Tea Party. I do think that this is something of worthy debate because oftentimes you see, and regardless of what this person says, I'm just saying any person in general, 
you have to be very careful with determining whether or not that person is incited uh, in a, an act of you know violent protest and whatnot. So it, it, anyway, it's I just bring that up because it is a unique part of Adam's history, which is the legacy part. Wondering how much of a role he had. Like I said earlier, he probably had some hot headed moments. That probably wasn't one of them, though, based on what I've read so far. But Adams, obviously, even with the Boston Tea Party, you know, starting with the with the Sons of Liberty, again, a whole other group out there with its own kind of history and its activities, he he started to become more even more prominent. He started to recognize that this was this was an, a time that no one could turn back. It's unclear as to when he really made that decision. Some people think it might have been the occupation of Boston. I I think based on what I've read so far, my opinion is that Adams really recognized, probably around the time of the Boston Tea Party, realized that this is not going to end very, very well. He had tried so many times, even with his connections uh, to the uh, representatives of the crown, he still couldn't get anything through. Adams became super duper involved in the Second Continental Congress. This is where he really gets a lot more prominence and a lot more recognition for his achievements. While we don't know the exact details of what exactly he did there, we get a sense they worked on a lot of committees, worked super duper hard. He was even able to convince maybe some moderates who really didn't know which way or another. They, they knew they were taking a risk but Adams was very, very persuasive, and he was able to get a lot of these people on board for independence. He helped, obviously, helped pass the Declaration of Independence. He signed it, just like the other signers. That's why he is number four in our in our Sacred Honor series, the probably the fourth person to sign the Declaration of Independence. Later on, he helped draft the Articles of Confederation. After uh, after all that fighting, I mean, he, he, he helped draft it. This idea of republicanism, of you know, state sovereignty. State sovereignty meaning like talking about the individual states. So this concern about a big central government. Those ideas were really espoused by Samuel Adams. He helped, you know, even go, uh, he even went back to Massachusetts it's kind of interesting. He went back to Massachusetts. They had a state constitution out there. It and it was actually initially rejected, but with the work of him and his other colleagues, they were able to barely pass it. But they implemented checks and balances, implemented an annual elections. Many of those things that he was fighting for in the American Revolution were being implemented right in front of his eyes. In fact, in, during the American Revolution, you might recall that John Hancock uh, was a kind of like a mentee of Samuel Adams. And they worked very well together for a while. But after the Second Continental Congress, they actually had quite a bit of tension between them, um, which, is, which is sad because I think they, they probably could have worked on a lot of more things before. Um, alternate history is, this is very, very challenging to examine. But what's interesting is when the Constitution was coming around, I'll just kind of briefly mention this, but uh, he and John Hancock realized, you know, we have bigger, we have a lot of differences. We didn't get along during the Continental Congress or after, but we, we have a lot of concerns with this new Constitution. We have to get a Bill of Rights. That would have been the kind of conversation he had with John Hancock, and successfully he was able to spur that movement for the Bill of Rights. He also obviously supported Washington. He had a lot of confidence in our kind of our show's nick show namesake, excuse me, our show's namesake of, of George Washington and his faith in Washington as a commander in chief. I think he, Adams had a lot of respect for who Washington was. Adams, you know, was not always the most successful guy in politics. I know that he was very, very prolific in the writing, but he uh, he went back to the state senate in Massachusetts. Uh, but he 
he was definitely a guy who could question your virtues if you were not completely on board with his idea of republicanism. That probably was one of the reasons why he lost um, at least a few congressional races. Um, he actually ran against John Hancock at one point, uh, supported a another challenger, James Otis. Uh, it was uh, very – it, it defines a lot of what Adams w- was as a person. He was someone who was well-read. He b- truly believed in these values, and often, oftentimes it cost him. It certainly cost him his fortune. He, again, like I said earlier, he could have been a lot richer had he – went along with what Governor Hutchinson was offering, or Bernard, even Thomas Gage, uh, the British commander uh, or governor. He probably could have gotten a lot from him, but he, he just would not, he would not compromise his integrity. He he strongly, he felt so passionate for these views that he was just never, ever going uh, to let it be bought off. I want to before we get to the reflection phase of our episode today. I want to read a little bit from a letter that he writes, and he writes it as Candidus, uh, which is just a a pseudonym for himself. And he writes in the Boston Gazette in April, on April twelfth, seventeen seventy three. So this was several months before the Boston Tea Party. And he writes something that I think is very, very interesting. Uh, I won't read the whole thing again, but I'll read a couple parts here. The first is that he talks about, in the first paragraph, he explains how he had just recently attended this this meeting um, with concerned citizens and representatives, and they're talking about really what the uh, British government was doing. And really understand, re- recognizing that there was something very, very fishy happening. And for some reason, a lot of these officials are getting a lot of money. And here's what Adams is writing. He explains this scheme that the British had in plan. The first part of their plan, they imagined they had finished. That is the establishment of a revenue. And though this was far from being sufficient to answer their whole purpose, they thought that if they could put the people to sleep, they might the more easily add to this revenue at some future time and plead the present submission for a precedent. They therefore began upon the second and equally important part of their plan, which is to appropriate the revenue they had raised to set up an executive absolutely independent of the legislative, which is to say the least, the nearest approach to absolute tyranny. Unquote. I'm going to stop there. What he's essentially saying is he realized that the government, what they do is that they say, we need to, we need money to build stuff and to do this and do that. And, and they, they always kind of, they just tell people saying, if you do this, don't worry. Well, we got it. Then later on, they're like, well, you know, we, we need more money. We, we don't have this. We don't have, we haven't built that. Uh, we'll, we're going to need, need to raise the taxes here. What, what goes on behind the scenes though, is that they, they appropriate the money, but, and they say, well, this executive, this person is in charge of it. Um, however, there's so many other people who are getting money from, from the scheme. And remember, not all this taxation, all this stuff is is not happening with any representation. This is really obviously why Adams was so involved in the ta- no taxation without representation movement. Um, un- unless, and, and nowadays, unless you live in Washington D.C., in this case, you'll you will have to drive around with the license plate that says taxation without representation for a long, long while. Probably will never ever take off take off that expression off of your license plate if you're live if you're living in DC at the moment. Then Adams really makes some something that's very, very uh, it's kind of kind of funny in a way too. I know he's trying to be serious here. But uh he says he basically says that you realize that a lot of these British Crown government officials are making a lot of money out of this whole scheme. And what he's saying is these officials essentially look down at people 
they think that the people whom they're supposed to represent are just a bunch of people protesting uh, these acts because they have no money or that they're dumb or that they don't realize what's going on. <laughs> but then Adam says, well, little did they think that it was then known as it now appears in fact that those who were assiduously watching for places, preferment and pensions were in truth the very men of no property, and that no other way of mending their shattered fortunes by being the sharers in the spoils of their country. Unquote. So this is kind of a jab towards loyal the loyalist government. He's essentially saying, yes, so these government officials who think that the people are dumb, what's what he has realized is that the the people who really don't have any money and and don't have anything going on in their lives are the actual government officials who who are raising taxes because they have no money. They isn't like the government officials. We have they have no money and so they have to take it from everybody else. And 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 obviously if you're loyalist you're reading this, you're probably really, really hating Samuel Adams at this point. But the point is is that in this letter, Adams is essentially defining what government should be doing. You know, the whole idea is it's not about having no taxes. The idea is that you need to have pe- have people have a say and understand where this money is going. They have to know who's responsible, who is holding accountable, who is conducting oversight on taxation. That is really, really, really central here. And he and he kind of, like I say, he makes a jab at government officials who really are the ones who have nothing going on and they have to take money from people. And he and when the way he describes it is very very sentimental. And a lot of people hear this. He actually even said that a lot of people were shocked at just how this is happening right in front of their eyes. And this is really what's going to really take a lot of patience out of people. Even and, and towards the end he says, "Well, there is a degree of patience beyond which human nature will not bear." Unquote. Yes, I, I, I totally agree, and I think a lot of people do, because all this is snowballing, um, and Samuel Adams really encapsulates what people are thinking. He takes what they're feeling, he projects it out there for people to understand. That was one of his big, big talents. Adams, unfortunately, would have some health problems later on in his life. He probably would have been a lot more active, probably would have done a lot more. Uh, had he not had health issues, but he did have some health issues later on. And on October 2nd, 1803, he dies at the age of 81. Now, Samuel Adams is a figure who is very well known, not just in the beer world, um, but clearly, but he also in American history. And just like with my traditional episode format, I have compiled a few takeaways for us from Samuel Adams. And Adams, I mean, we're we're covering this in about 30 to 40 minutes. Honestly, Adams is a figure who is going to be started for a very long time. And uh, I think kind of maybe to his wishes, uh, if he were to be alive today, he would not want to be the uh, the guy who only appears in one episode, he's going to somehow creep in into our future conversations and interviews and uh, episodes, all the rest about American history, one way or another. But number one is that I think we really need to be mindful of political skills and methods to make positive change and not just our own political agenda. What I mean is that, see, Adams was not the only guy who had this idea of independence, but he had something unique, which is that ability to write and to speak and to lobby, influence, make connections. These are part of his toolkit. And when we believe in a political idea, we need to be wary that it might not be the message that is the problem necessarily. Certainly in Adam's case, it was, the message, the problem wasn't the message, but I would say even in his life, there were times when the way he was conveying his message uh, cost him a connection or cost him support. And that's something that a lot of people nowadays might not understand very well, is that everyone 
believes firmly believes in their own political views, right? Uh, but how many people are thinking about those o- other ways to convince people or to persuade? Imagine how much effort it took for Adams to write these articles. That kind of effort needs to be translated into a lot what a lot of people are doing politically. A lot of people think that a tweet or a Facebook post is, is going to change people's minds. I'm telling you, it's not. You know, it, it's a long process. It takes so people are going to be persuaded in different ways. And you can't change a person's political view overnight. And certainly Adams, I don't think, ever really believed that either. He always believed that he needed to be he needed to continue to write and to speak to people and to rile people up and to bring a crowd and everything because he knew that this is how people uh, get involved and connect with one another. And then they talk to each other. Then they tell their friends, hey, I went to this cool speech that Adams gave about the arguments for uh, breaking away from Britain. Let's let's talk about that. This is really the framework we need to be working on, which is having civil methods. Yes, it was a very violent time during that time. And um, no doubt that people will say whatever they want about Adams uh, role in uh, mob violence and all that. Um, I don't think he's really that that involved personally, um, despite what some historians might say. But anyway, just be mindful and make sure that when you convey your message, make sure you find those persuasive avenues, ones that require a lot of hard work and a lot of research and dedication so you can get your message across to people who might be maybe on the fence. If they don't change their mind, that's okay. As long as you show respect and you you believe in the values of this nation, I, I think that it can really go a long way. Number two is we need to, we, we, we have to know we can repair some fractured political relationships. And we can, and as a result, we can work together on larger important issues, even if there are political differences. This is obviously a reference to uh, Adams' relationship with Hancock. These two guys were not speaking to each other for years, what well, they probably should have. But then when it came to that important crossroads, knowing that the future of America was on the line, Adams and Hancock both knew that they had to set aside their differences. And they had to fight for something that was even larger than themselves. It does take two to, or more to tango in this case. We can never, I don't think we can repair, unfortunately, every single um, political fracture with every single person. Uh, it never happened then. I don't think it, can, it can never happen nowadays. But we can always make an effort. We can always be that person to take the moral high ground and, rec- and tell that person, say, Look, we I know we have differences. I know we've we've said some things to each other in the past. If if there is that mutual trust, that trust but verify sort of mindset, you, even even mending just one broken relationship between two people can make a huge difference. And you will feel a lot better about that too. I think you'll have more faith in that person and really the ability to have Americans come together and heal and have a more perfect union. And the last is to never surrender your integrity. I mentioned earlier about Adam's attempts, uh, well, I should say the attempts of the British to influence Adams. He would not budge. I mean, the only really big source of income he was able to really get later on in his life was actually his, the passing of his one of his sons who had quite a bit of wealth. But he was not going to give up that conviction, and and neither should you. We we can never ever give up our integrity. We have to defend those morals and those values. There's never a wrong time to do something right, and that's what I think. Adams and and Bell, who was not a perfect man, he probably said some things they probably shouldn't have, and I'm really more talking about his uh, relationship with some, maybe some other folks, the other patriots and other uh, people on the on the patriot side. Uh, but I, I think he demonstrates something that is very, very rare. Um, and he sets a 
pattern for, for a mold for people to fit in. Um, it's hard to replicate exactly what his career was, but this idea that he wasn't afraid to speak about these ideas of freedom, of opportunity, um, even going as far, you know, I read somewhere where, you know, as uh, later on in political office, he, he even believed in the, this full virtue of providing public school education, especially to girls. I mean, that's a huge step. Yes, it, he was very much criticized, but he believed in these virtues, the value of virtue of an elected official and as America's citizen. That is really, really central for Samuel Adams. All in all, I've learned a lot about Samuel Adams. Like I said earlier, I kind of thought he was a little crazy, and maybe he is. But uh, I, the, the world wouldn't change without a little crazy, I guess you could say. But Adams really was, I think, so successful in being able to, to bridge a lot of divides that a lot of people might not have had the courage to do so. Um, so I hope you had a great time listening and learning about Samuel Adams uh, you probably finished your bottle of beer if you were uh, drinking it as you were listening. And I hope it was as delicious as the freedom that Samuel Adams helped fight for. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, make sure you subscribe to this channel. Look out for future announcements about Patreon and about other news that are coming for friends and fellow citizens. Have a great rest of your day, rest of your week. And remember, a day in America always gets better when we are with our friends and fellow citizens.